how long do I have for my little speech? I was told I have 15 minutes. And I asked myself, how do you fold three decades into 15 minutes? It's impossible. So all I'm going to do is to share with you a few moments, some anecdotes, to give you an idea what the life on Gush Katif were and how much we put in it, how much love, how much effort, how much emuna, every step of our way there, as well as to tell you in a little bit of details about the expulsion and what we have experienced, a trauma that doesn't leave us till this day. My husband and I were living in a lovely apartment in the center of Israel. And actually, we had everything that every young couple wishes to have. But yet we felt that we needed something else in life. We wanted to build a new settlement in Israel, a new place in Israel, a new community. We found out eventually we got to Gush Katif. We arrived there and we knew that that was the place for us. Pure sand dunes. There was nothing there. Only one community existed. It was Netzer Khazani. And we went to visit and see what it's all about. And we fell in love with the place immediately. There were yellow pure sand dunes and a few little houses with red roofs as if they were growing out of the sand. And on the side, another area of hot houses, green houses made out of glass. We went into one of them and we saw a farmer of Netzer Khazani planting tomato seeds in the warm soil of Gush Katif. He had seeds in his palm and there were pipes, dripping pipes, stretched all along. By every drip, there was a little bit of a wet area. He took one seed each time, made a tiny little hole with his finger, and put the seed in and prayed that it will grow and give crop. We settled in Gush Katif, first in a temporary place, very tiny little house of 40 square meters. But we were the happiest people out. We knew nothing about agriculture. We knew nothing about growing, but we got guidance. And we had tons of emuna. At the beginning, we grew tomatoes and different kinds of flowers. When after a few years of trying this and that and the other, and you know, learning time is rebegelt. You pay before you get something out. My husband decided that the best growth for the soil of Gush Katif, which was sand, as I was saying, is amaryllis bulbs. Now, in order to grow amaryllis bulbs, you need to wait four years from the time you cut them and you put them in the ground until you can pick them and market them uh, to Europe or to America. Again, it was a long-term growth, but with so much emuna, we knew that something is going to come out of it. 18 years later, I mean, we were in, in Gush Katif for 28 years, but 18 years we grew amaryllis bulbs. 18 years later, we had a flourishing and a prosperous hothouse, a farm that marketed to the United States and it gave me the thought that tiny little Israel and even tiny Gush Katif is exporting to huge America. And that gave us a very strong feeling of pride to know that we are doing something in Eretz Israel. That life in Gush Katif was a life work. And as we gave love to the, to the soil, to the land, it gave us back. As if it was waiting for 2,000 years for the Jews to come back to Gush Katif and to start working the land. In fact, that stretch of land that Gush Katif was settled in 
was never, ever populated. I don't think that even a camel went through there. It was the Jews who come to the desert and flourish it, and not the other way around. There was a lot of strength in Gush Katif, plenty of yeshivot, ulpena. Everything at the, was really mighty there. When I was traveling throughout Gush Katif roads, just before the expulsion, I looked around and I said to myself, it cannot happen. This place is so strong, so big, so successful. How could a thing like this happen? One day, I saw the Karen Kayemet planting trees next to our Yeshuv, and I asked them, could I have also one plant? They gave me three plants of eucalyptus trees. I planted them. 28 years later, they were like a four-story building, high and so strong. And that is also like symbolized the strength of, of Gush Katif. Everything went almost fine, not everything, because we also had intifada, security problems. We saw our friends getting injured and killed, but nothing, nothing made us despair. We held onto Gush Katif because this was our place to be. And what happened was that in 2005, former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon announced that by the end of 2005, there will be no longer Jews in the Gaza Strip. Now, I have a very big problem with that declaration. You know, if you'll, ha if you'll say that by the end of 2013 there will be no Jews in Brooklyn or in New Jersey or anywhere else in France, we will all be shattered and shocked. But that announcement, I don't know, it didn't shock enough. I couldn't understand how Ariel Sharon, who was the father of the settlements, the father of the Yashvut is saying a thing like this. It took us by surprise, and we decided to do anything and everything in our power to try and stop that decision. Everything in a legal way. We protested. We prayed. We made a human chain that started in Gush Katif and ended in Jerusalem in the Kotel Maravi. Tens of thousands of people were holding hands like a human chain that will never break, and that didn't help. Eventually, the day came. A day before the soldiers came in, our rabbi gathered us in our shul. He said, I would like to see you all in Mincha. You know, normally only the men go. So we all gathered there. And he said, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, family of Ganeital, we did anything and everything in our power to try and stop the government's decision to expel Jews from Gush Katif. But we failed. Tomorrow, the soldiers are coming. They are going to tell you that your time is up and you have to leave your homes. I've never demanded anything of you. Whenever I had something to say, I always asked nicely. But this time, I'm going to demand no one is going to raise a hand on a soldier. No one is going to act violent. I know the emotional situation you are in. And that's why I'm saying it. These soldiers are our brothers and our children serve in the same army as they do. They are just victim of the system. If you have something to tell them, do that, but don't act violently. And we did. On a day after Tisha B'Av, we went to Shacharit. And when we came back, the soldiers were there waiting for us. And I want to give you just a little bit of a picture that serene place called Ganeital, in our yard, front yard, 
was always so peaceful. And all of a sudden, between these two big eucalyptus trees, which I planted 28 years earlier, we saw a big group of soldiers standing there, waiting for the officer to say, now you go. Every two soldiers, every two officers entered another house. And that's the first time in my life that I knew what soft knees meant. I really felt that I couldn't stand on my feet. They came to us and we told them, we told them what they did, what we did along the years and what it means to expel Jews from their homes. They just looked at us. But I just want to take you a week before. My daughter wanted to show a friend her father's work life before everything is finished and demolished. And they drove up, it was up because our hothouses were uphill. They drove up to the hothouse and she looked around and she couldn't quite recognize the farm, her father's farm, where she visited so many times. So she phoned up her father to say, listen, Daddy, I'm here and I want to show a friend that your farm, but I'm not sure that I got to the right place. Where's the big warehouse? We, not warehouse, sorry, packing house. We had a big, big packing house to pack, to wash and pack our crop. And her father said to her, listen, Gailey, this is finished. This is the last crop I ever sent from Gush Katif. And there's not going to be any more. I had no choice. I took apart that big packing house. Maybe one day I'll have use of it somewhere else, wherever they're going to locate us. And when he said, our time is up and it's finished, it's the first time that actually he allowed his ears to hear in words what it means to lose a life work. And they both burst out crying. They couldn't carry on that conversation. That was one difficult moment, but we had many more afterwards. After the soldiers went away, we went back to the shul for the last mincha, to Davin last mincha. That was the saddest prayers I've ever attended to. Even you know, parts of Yom Kippur tefillah was, was, was said during the, the, the service. And after the service was finished, I don't know where the friends, the people of, of Ganeital took the strength to start singing loudly songs from the tefillah. I believe that they wanted to engrave in the walls of that shul some kind of memory that once upon a time there was a big congregation who loved the place, built it with ten fingers and went through hardships and didn't despair. We wanted to leave a mark with those tunes that we sang in shul. Then it's finished. Every family entered their own private car and he, we were heading to a guest house in Chafetz Chaim. Actually, we were heading an unknown future for us. We were sitting in a car, my daughter, my son, and one lemon tree that we took out of the ground, that lemon tree that we planted on the last two bishvat, and we really prayed and hoped and promised ourselves that we're still going to eat from its fruit. We, we had it in the car and we waited for our younger daughter, who was 17 and a half at the time, and she didn't show up. And we waited and we waited and eventually we sent our son to see where she was. And he found her in the shul. Sorry, it doesn't become any easier standing by the Aron Kodesh and crying a heart out, not understanding 
why she has to leave the place where she was born, raised, had a beautiful childhood, fantastic youth, and all of a sudden, for no reason, she has to part from it. My son took her, and he brought her into the car, and then we drove out, the last time, out of our beautiful, beautiful, flourishing Yeshuv. We even gave water to our plants a day before. You don't stop watering your plants just because you're not going to be there the next day. This is how we felt towards the place. We drove out and we arrived in Chafetz Chaim. A week later, we felt that we needed a closure. We didn't really say a proper goodbye because the day that we were forced to leave was so full of emotions and we weren't quite there. So we took ourselves, we got a special permit from the army and we drove back to Gush Katif. But this time we stood on the ruins of our beautiful house which we've built for so many years. We haven't built it at once. We had a little house and then we expanded it and then we finished it. It took years, but it took six minutes to demolish it, six minutes to bulldoze it. We stood there and we tried to see which part of wall belonged where. And that's how, for the last time, really for the last time, we said goodbye to Gush Katif. And now, what we are left with is memories, but not only memories. Our goal is to engra engrave in every soul and mind in Israel and out of Israel what happened in Gush Katif, so that will never happen again. And that's why Gush Katif Museum has to not only exist, but also expand. And we have now a window of opportunity to buy the building and make sure that the Gush Katif Museum carries on existing, expanding, and accepting more and more people. Over 60 members of parliament, Israeli parliament, visited already. And shall I tell you something? They come in in one form and they go out different, completely different. When they see what happened there, funnily enough, a lot of them don't really re realize it till that moment. But they come out with a different mind, with a different vision. Some of them who are not known as very right-wing parties said that should never happen again. And that was after the visit in the museum. The Minister of Education, Gidon Sa'ar, after he finished his visit there, he said every student in Israel should come to that museum and have that studying tour to know what happened. And another minister said, Uzi Dayan, a former high officer in the IDF, he said never again, and he doesn't really come from the, from the right parties. So there we are. Remembering Gush Katif, we of course will never forget anything, not one part of it, but not only remembering, but strengthening Israel and strengthening the public opinion against a move like this, this should never happen again. Thank you very much. שלושה ילדים, עם ארבעה נכדים ועם חתן אחד. 